I'm George Packer from The New Yorker, and we have a, a really extraordinary panel tonight to talk about Islam in the West, a title that I've already been told by most of the panel is inadequate or misguided. Um, <laughs> but we're just going to go ahead with it anyway. On my far left, your far right, is Lawrence Wright, who's a New Yorker staff writer and the author of Saints and Sinners. author of Saints and Sinners, Twins and Remembering Satan, parts of which first appeared in the magazine and won the 1994 National Magazine Award for reporting. A new book, The Looming Tower, Al-Qaeda and the Road to 9-11, was published in August. His most recent article about jihadi theorists and the future of Al-Qaeda is in the September 11th issue of The New Yorker. Next to Larry is Azar Nafisi. She's the author of the memoir, Reading Lolita in Tehran. <laughs> about her experience teaching Western literature to female students in revolutionary Iran. She's a visiting fellow and professional lecturer at the Foreign Policy Institute of Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. And she's currently at work on two books, The Republic of the Imagination and Things I Have Been Silent About, A Meditation on Loss and Culture. Next to her is Omar Ahmed. He was born in Amman, Jordan in 1959 and emigrated to the United States as a teenager. He's the founder and chairman emeritus of the Council on American Islamic Relations, the largest Muslim civil liberties group in North America. He's also the president and CEO of a software technology company in Silicon Valley. So please welcome Omar Ahmed. <laughs> On my right is Ayan Hirsi Ali. She was born in <clears throat> She was born in Mogadishu, Somalia. She conceived the film <clears throat> Submission Part 1 about Quranic rationales for violence against women which she co-wrote with the filmmaker Theo van Gogh who was later assassinated. Hirsi Ali was a member of the Dutch Parliament from 2003 to 6 and is now a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. She's the author of a forthcoming memoir, Infidel, and a collection of essays, The Caged Virgin. <laughs> Next to her is Abdullahi Ahmed An-Naim. He's a native of northern Sudan and is the Charles Howard Chandler, professor of law at Emory University. He's the author of Towards an Islamic Reformation and African Constitutionalism and the Role of Islam, which will be published later this year. He's currently at work on a book about the future of Sharia and secularism from an Islamic perspective. Please welcome Professor An Naim. <clears throat> and next to him is Mahmoud Mamdani, who was born in Kampala, Uganda, and is the author of more than a dozen books, including most recently, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. He's the Herbert Lehman Professor of Government in the Department of Anthropology and Political Sci Science and the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. And he's a chief advisor to the United Nations High-Level Panel on Alliance of Civilizations for 2005 and 6. Please welcome Professor Mondani. <laughs> I want to ask each of you to answer a question that I'm going to preface with a few pieces of, of news that we're, most of us are familiar with, and I'm going to ask Larry Wright to start. This is what you find out when you open the newspaper or when you turn on the TV. Danish cartoons are published in an obscure provincial newspaper, and within a few months, cities around the Islamic world are scenes of violent demonstrations. The Pope gives a lecture in which he quotes a 14th century Byzantine emperor saying that Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, brought nothing but violence and bad things. Soon thereafter, churches are burned, a nun is killed, and there are protests in the streets. Ayan Hirsi Ali has to travel with her own private bodyguards. President Bush begins to use the term 
Islamic fascism as opposed to simply terrorism. What is the problem? <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you so much for starting with me. Um, I guess that all of these, to some extent, are questions of identity. And um, the, uh, I, I think many Muslims feel like their identity is at stake. And I think that if you're living in Northern Europe, there are more Muslims than Catholics. If you're living in Southern Europe, there are more Muslims than Protestants. If you're living in Belgium, the number one name for a new child born in Belgium is Muhammad. And if you happen to be a Flemish ancestry, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, where is this going? What's happening to my country, to my culture, to my history, to my language? That's part of my identity. And if you're Muhammad, you're thinking, these people don't want me. I'll never be one of them. And it could be that Muhammad doesn't speak Arabic and maybe has never been to Morocco. He's lost. And uh, so he feels isolated and separated from any culture that really embraces him. It's not surprising that he goes to the mosque and meets other young men like him. And it's not surprising that the imam would minister to the anger and the alienation that they feel. And it's not surprising that when they identify themselves as Muslims, as they do in those cultures so strongly, because that is at least an identity, that they would feel insulted when someone publishes a cartoon or the Pope makes a remark. I think there's a hypersensitivity that has to do with the absence of any other identity to hold on to. That's, I think, the case in Europe. I think it's different in, it's certainly different in the U.S. where the Muslim population is much more well integrated. Um, the average Muslim in America makes a higher wage than the average American, is less likely to be in prison than the average American compared to the situation in France where about 7% of the population is Muslim and 50% of the prisoners are Muslim. In, and then you have the situation in the Arab and Muslim world and they, they feel a sense of defeat that is so palpable. Um, if you um, took the oil out of the Arab economies, the 300 million Arabs produce less for export than the five million Finns, essentially less than the Nokia telephone company. So we're talking about very barren economies that may be growing, but are often growing at, a, uh, at less of the rate than the population. They feel themselves continually slipping behind. So all of those things are sense of that their identities and their cultures are in danger. I, I think that one of the problems that we have now, we have such an essentialist, I mean the dominant view on, on, on all these discourses and to put all these images within the discourse is um, um, uh, so dominated by a sense of reductionism. We now use this term Muslim world, you know, so, 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 so carelessly. Um, you think of the Muslim world, you think of just those of us in the panel who come from that world. Um, are you talking about Iran? Are you talking about Saudi Arabia? Are you talking about Morocco? Are you talking about Sudan? Are you talking about um, Indonesia? Are you talking about Malaysia? Are you talking about Bosnia? I mean, we have now reduced all these cultures with very, very different backgrounds, very different traditions, very different histories. Um, we lump them all together to one component, uh, which is Muslim. So my first objection is to this reductionism of, of uh, I, I think that we should retrieve and reclaim um, our, our individual names and our individual identities. After all, we don't call uh, France and England and U.S. and Germany all Christian, the Christian world, and they have far more in common. Uh, than any of these countries that I mentioned. And, and the second point very, very shortly that I wanted to mention is that then the victim becomes religion itself because you then reduce all the different varieties of Islam. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, you can go on forever talking about them into one component of that religion, which is the loudest and, and, and the most violent. And, and so in a sense then, those people who have used religion as a political ideology and who have confiscated that religion um, become representatives of the whole world. I, I would like the American people to differentiate between Islam and Muslims. 
Islam is a religion that's based on Quran and, and tradition of the Prophet. 1500 years ago, it brought the Arabian Bedouins from being uh, desert people to civilization in about 20 years time. So this is in a, in a nutshell what the Muslims believe today. So when Islam is being attacked as a religion, they take a lot of offense why it's being attacked as a religion. Now Muslims are the people who practice this religion. Their practice might or might not be in accordance to Islam. And most of what we hear in the media, most of the time, it does not, it's in spite of Islam rather, it's because of Islam. So to differentiate between the two is very important. And when we talk about Islam and the West, most, more appropriate will be maybe the Muslim world than the West, because there are Muslims in the United States, Muslims are in the West, and also there are people who are converts to Islam. All of a sudden when you lump them all being Islam as a religion and the West as a region, it will be difficult to comprehend. Second point, most of the challenges that the Muslims face, there is a lot of them, I believe 80% of them are internal, and the, the doing of Muslims themselves, 80 or more. External interference will probably account to less than 20% of the problems that the Muslim have. And the Muslim world, lack of human rights, lack of women rights, lack of freedom of speech, it's all because of the decline in civilization for about two, two to 300 years since the Ottoman Empire and lack of knowledge in the Muslim world. Scholarship is down, uh, writing books is down, where the Muslims, that I would say, relatively speaking, Muslims had more rights 1,200 years ago in terms of human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, freedom to assembly, protest, than they have today, relatively speaking, before they had more. Because of the decline, there is a sense of defeat, there is a sense of being victims. 70% of refugees in the world are Muslims. So when these numbers are quoted to any young person, they, they don't like it. Number three, one of the biggest challenges is extremism in the Muslim world and violent extremism. And I believe this is not the first time that Muslims faced, were faced with such extremism. It happened about 200 years or maybe 150 years after the Prophet, a group named Al-Khawarij came and they were very extreme in their interpretation of Islam. They even doubted the cousin and the relatives of the Prophet saying they are no longer good Muslims. And the only way that Muslims were able to defeat them is by dialogue and by, you know, or, or by talking to them, by discussion with these groups, and they were able to, to remove them from what they're thinking before. So what I would say is the solution is really in the hands of the Muslims. There is no way, I would say, external interference in the Muslim world will make things worse. The example of Iraq is it's about us. We try to fix the put democracy there, we open the bag of worms. It's much worse than it used to be before. I think Bush right now is probably dreaming and saying what would Saddam will do now. He probably needs the advice of Saddam how he will do, how he would act there. In, in the also external interferences, which is the 20% or less, are two folds. People in the Muslim world, they feel there is an attack on Islam. Whether it's true or not, but that's the perception they have. Pope comment will add to it. The Holland cartoons is nothing to the West, but it's a big deal for Muslims in the street. Uh, when Bush made, make a speech, you know, Islam and fascism and so on, it rings, it will be reported widely. So they see those comments coming from all corners of the world, and they see it's, everybody is ganging up on Muslims. And that's why they will be upset, and some of them will become violent in their protest, which is, should not happen, but that's how they react to these incidents. Lastly, the Palestinian issue. I would say if, we, if there is a just, and I would underline three lines under the word just, and peaceful resolution to the Palestinian issue, and which I am a Palestinian, originally Palestinian, I think seven, it will not solve the problems, but 70% of the wind that the people are using to, to make these issues harder and more violent is because of the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And I think we should look back and, and not because we want to solve this issue, because it's the right thing to do. You know, there are people are oppressed, and as people who love freedom, we should like freedom for others. And the Palestinians did not have a freedom for so many years, and they deserve freedom. Uh, 
Islam, Islamic philosophy, and the philosophy upon which the West is based, and for me West, I mean open societies, are incompatible. The Islamic world is in a crisis. Violence, repression, ignorance, fundamentalism, and exodus is out of the countries of origin. And third, the long-awaited debate within Islam, we've been waiting for it for more than 400 years, 1400 years, is now taking place, and the West is making it possible. Islam, as a philosophy, takes individual life and demands from individual life sub to submit to the will of Allah. That is the definition of Islam. That submission of the will to an external invisible entity um, is enforced using guidelines that are written in a book, the Quran, and the Sunnah, words and deeds attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. These works contain a detailed list of what is permitted and what is uh, prohibited. When I talk about the West, for me, I say it again, it's an open society. And the outset means that there is freedom of the individual. And freedom, I define as Hayek defines, it is being free from being coerced by another person. And that the coercion or force is limited to the state. The monopoly of coercion is within the state, and the state itself is limited. So it's not arbitrary. Islam says that life on earth and freedom and so on is not possible. You have to adhere to that list of what is prohibited and what is permitted. Life on earth is just a transition and it's life in the hereafter, which of course in Western society is not possible. So the two are mutually exclusive. For you to be free within Islamic philosophy, you have to die first. And I think that is the most salient, the most important difference between Western philosophy and Islamic philosophy. And the sooner we acknowledge that, the better. When ideas compete and ideas clash, it depends on how principled those who adhere to those ideas are. The more the West engages in relativism, be it moral or principled relativism, the more it will lose. For Islam, probably we would say good news as long as this debate today on stage among all these Muslims is possible. I consider myself no longer a believing Muslim, but I consider myself a product of that faith and a product of that heritage and a product of that civilization. And it's more important for me to answer the question why I have come to defect to the West and to the Western concept of freedom than being an infidel. Well, to start with, I'm a Muslim. And I make no apology for being a Muslim, and I see no contradiction between being a Muslim and being whatever else I want to be. Completely, absolutely out of conviction, out of belief, out of experience. The answer to George's question at one level is that there is no problem, really. Meaning, what, meaning that what we see is, in fact, a product of history. It's a process of contestation, of challenge, of power conflicts, of politics on a global scale. Uh, even the, like the cartoon, the fact that uh, it is part of the freedom of expression paradigm that some people express opinion, other people protest. Some people protest violently and that the violence should not be permitted. But the idea that of having a protest in relation to what is being said uh, is, is really inherent to the idea itself. So there is no problem at one level. What I see are possibilities. And the question for me is what we make of them. Not that we can hope that we can somehow iron all our differences. I think being human is to be different. So difference is inherent to the human condition. Uh, Ahmed said that we should distinguish and Hersi agreed between Islam and Muslims. I don't think that you can make that distinction. Islam is what Muslims make of it. Because we have no way of knowing Islam other than through the experience and understanding, interpretation, and behavior of Muslims. 
the fact that there is a pristine abstract idea of Islam out there whether it is true or not is irrelevant because we have no way of knowing except through human being so human agency is integral to, to what it is possible to know about Islam, to understand, to practice, and to live by it. Uh, I think what I, what I said about history is that colonialism to Americans is, is not really as a vivid uh, or as a powerful experience as it is for us as Africans, for example. Because probably this product, of course, this society after all is a colonizing society. I mean, you are a product of colonialism. But for us, colonialism meant a denial of our integrity, of our human dignity, of our sovereignty. And what we see is the post-colonial condition. It is not something to do with Islam or Muslims per se, it is to do with the post-colonial condition. In this part of the world where Muslims are significant members of the majority or minority communities, uh, Islam becomes a medium of expression of, of the tension and the crisis of the post-colonial. I, I, I think that what I see is in fact a problem with the title of this panel or this town hall, Islam and the West. I see this as incoherence upon incoherence. <laughs> because there is no coherent West and there is no coherent Islam. There is extreme diversity as was already made the point <coughs> among Muslims and that's what we can talk about, Muslims, not Islam in the abstract. When we talk about Muslims, we talk about history. We talk about politics. We talk about economics, but not Islam as an abstraction. So there is no coherent West, and there is no coherent Islam. The other incoherence is contradistinction between a world religion and a geopolitical region. I mean, you can say Islam and Christianity, that would be coherent. And you can say, for example, the Arab world and West, that will be coherent. But it's not Islam and the West. So th those are some of the elements I find, uh, I think, in the title of this panel, which is very common now everywhere you see, is the essentialization and the reductionism that was, was mentioned earlier, which defines Muslims as Muslims and nothing else but Muslims. And when you do that, they will act as such. But if you take Muslims as human beings with all the complexity of what it is to be human, and religion is part of it, but it is not the, the whole uh, truth of it, then I have a way to maneuver. I have a way of relating to you at a level of shared struggle, shared vision, solidarity. But if you box me into a Muslim, the only way I can react is as a Muslim, and I, which I think does a disservice to both of us. So I'm a Muslim, yes but I'm also a human rights advocate. I am a father, I am a lawyer, <laughs> you know, many things. And all of these identities, talk about identities, for me are overlapping, they are not inconsistent. And I negotiate what they mean. And I think I should stop on that. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Mambani, you're the author of Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, which has an analysis of the problem. What's, what's the problem? Well, let me begin with what's not the problem. Uh, because I don't think the problem is hypersensitivity. Uh, I think there's a real problem. And, and, and we need to address the real problem. Uh, let, me, let me give you a, an example, which comes from the history of this society. In 1965, the Watts riots happened. And the Watts riots were triggered by a very banal, simple incident of petty racism between a cop and a motorist. But many people were killed. And many asked, what's the problem with these people? Such a small incident and so many people died in riot after riot, the long, hot summer. What's the problem? President Johnson appointed a commission, the Kerner Commission, and the commission's report said, let us distinguish between the fuel and the trigger. The trigger was a petty act. The fuel was hundreds of years of racism. Let us not address the petty act. Let us address the history of racism. Now, I want us to understand one thing, that free speech has a double history. The history of free speech has a dark side to it. 
And that dark side is not the history of blasphemy. It's the history of bigotry. It's the history where a group is set up, in the worst case, where the Jewish people were set up by a history of bigotry for genocide. At the time of the Danish cartoons, there was an interview with Gunter Grass, <clears throat> the German writer. And Gunter Grass in his interview pointed out that there was a paper, a German paper, Der Sturmer, and the editor of Der Sturmer, Der Sturmer used to have cartoons. Gunter Grass said these cartoons, the, the Danish cartoons reminded him of Der Sturmer cartoons. And the editor of Der Sturmer was tried at Nuremberg and was killed. What I'm saying is let's put this in a context. The Pope, the Danish cartoons, etc., a people are being set up. This is happening in the course of something called the war on terror. The war on terror is not a war on terrorists. It's a war on terror. And there's a difference. The war on terror gives you a blizzard watch. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, but it's not really a blizzard watch because if there's no blizzard, then it's proof that the watch is working. <laughs> I want to say one more thing because this panel is, again, I want to join those who are protesting about the title of the panel. It should have been called What's Wrong with Islam? Because it's not a panel about Islam and the West. Where is the West here? Okay, you brought a set of... <laughs> excuse me. You brought a set of uh, 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 good Muslims and bad Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> and you want them to go at one another. Now, I'll tell you why I think there's a problem. A couple of years ago, my family and I, we went on a holiday to Turkey. As we were traveling around Mediterranean Turkey, we got to a small town and somebody took us to a house and said, Herodotus was born here. Another house, Homer was born here. I came back, I went to Colombia, I looked for my colleague, I said, Nenny, I didn't know Herodotus was a Turk. I didn't know Homer was a Turk. She said, didn't you know the Turks are Greeks who became Muslims? She said, don't you know that as late as this century itself, thousands and thousands of Muslim Greeks were sent to Turkey and Christian Turks were sent to Greece? So is Turkey the heart of Western civilization? Or is it outside of it? What is this West? A University of Chicago historian, Thomas Hudson, wrote a history of the West and he said the West was initially simply the Western half of the Roman Empire. And then the West shrunk and it became the Christian part of that Western half. And then the West expanded and was racialized into white people, white Christian people everywhere, all over the world. What is this West? I suggest to you this West is a political project. This West is an imperial project. And that's the imperial project which is the real problem. Well, let me, let me say a word for both the title and the choice of panelists. <laughs> you were chosen not for your identities, but for your ideas. Um, and let me throw out a question that, that comes from this groundswell of opposition to the title. <laughs> let me suggest, or let me put it as a question. Is it possible that the reason why whoever thought up the title, which wasn't me, <laughs> is calling it Islam and the West rather than Islam and Christianity. Because in the 18th century, there was something called the Enlightenment in the West. And that historical event began a separation of faith and power, which defines politics in what we call the West, obviously meaning North America and Europe Whereas, as I'm told over and over when I travel in Islamic countries, you cannot separate faith and power in Islam. They are inextricable. There have been grand ayatollahs in my country who have been defrocked, 
who have been murdered, who have been jailed because they think that there should, that religion, for the purposes different from mine, um, who think that religion should be separate from, um, uh, from the state. Um, the, the whole philosophy um, of t it is far closer to fascist ideology and, and a communist ideology what these people preach um, than, than it is to uh, uh, you know, what they call traditional Islam. It is not just enlightenment that is the West. Totalitarianism is also the West. So we, we, this is our problem. Every single one of us in this room and, and outside it is implicated. I mean, I ask you, um, reducing the age of marriage from 18 to 9, should it be my culture? And if this is my culture, then burning witches in Salem is your culture. You know, not Emerson and Thoreau. Then, then uh, you know, uh, 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 slavery and inquisition are co your culture, and not St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine. We all have something to be ashamed of. And we all have something that we need to change. The Enlightenment, often is cited as, as a sort of a breakthrough, Kant and Hitler are both German. Meaning that the Enlightenment does, does not immune a people from falling into the depths of, of fascism and, and Nazism. Can, can I put you on the spot for a moment? Mm. You are the author of Towards an Islamic Reformation, which, for those of you who haven't read it, it's well worth reading. Uh, it acknowledges problematic verses in the Quran mm -hmm. that are incompatible with a modern idea of freedom and equality and it has a theoretical or methodological approach to how one can continue to be a Muslim without having to live by those problematic verses. So you yourself are calling for a kind of reform or modernization, if not enlightenment, of Islam in your own work. Absolutely, but, but I, I see no, no contradiction in that. The, the, the thing is that the Quran contains contradictory verses because it is addressed to a, 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 a sort of eternity of, of human experience which cannot be contained by a simple normative uh, framework. The point is that when I, when, I, uh, when I say that certain verses of the Quran are problematic, I cite other verses on which I can rely to contest the other verses, the, the, the problematic verses. Uh, that it was, Sharia was a construction. Sharia is not divine. Sharia is secular. Sharia is a product of human experience and interpretation. The first generations of Muslims interpreted Sharia emphasizing certain verses. I believe that other Muslims of today can emphasize other verses and reconstruct Sharia. If it was constructed in the first place, why not be reconstructed? In fact, it, you know, that book was translated into Indonesian and the title they use is the deconstruction of Sharia. And I think it's a brilliant, I wish I used that title because it is about Understanding that Sharia is, is a construct, it is not uh, something that comes from heaven divine for us to immediately follow. I, and I think that dynamism, by the way, I, I don't agree with Hershey when she said the debate we have been with, waiting for 1400 years is now happening and the West is enabling it. In fact, this debate, exactly on these terms, was going on in 8th century Baghdad. The same Baghdad that the United States is now occupying. That this, this level of vigor, of debate, of contestation has been there from the very beginning. I mean, uh, we, I can't really present a uh, 1500 century, 1500 years of, 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 of a world civilization, but please look up and see how much debate has been through, going out throughout the Muslim world, throughout history. Okay, Ms. Hirsi Ali, you wanted to say um, something. Yes, I, I find it rather disturbing, uh, all the cheering that goes on when one says the West is an imperialist entity and so on and so forth. What is the most defining feature of the West today, of Western nations? It's the fact that you and I can enjoy maximum freedom with, by states that we ourselves elect, we are the government. You have maximum freedom. I'm not saying it's perfect, but you have maximum freedom. You have institutions, you have courts, you have a balance of power, and so on and so forth. You can go about, and it is on average, it's not perfect, but you can go follow 
you know, make your own destiny as far as it, in, it is in your hands. Seek knowledge. And whatever you all know, you can put that together, and it only adds up to the progress of society. For me, that is the most defining feature of the West. I don't mean to say that the West did not have a totalitarian past or an imperialist past, or that it wasn't, it did not know tyrannies. It's just that in our present day, that is the most defining feature of the West. Men and women are assumed to be equal and are protected by the law. You can believe in whatever you believe. You can choose not to believe. There is no other. And you are free to sit here and to debate the imperfections of whoever rules you and of your own society. Think about it, shout about it, demonstrate, be hard or not be hard, but you have the freedom to object. There is no Islamic country or country with an Islamic majority where we can have this debate and where I can come out and say I'm an infidel and that I have a quarrel with the Prophet Muhammad. You can all have a quarrel with Jesus Christ. That is the most defining, the most defining feature of Islam. Let me uh, give Mr. Ahmed a chance you know, I, to jump I in. To disagree. I think Islam, multiple places in the Quran, God says, no compulsory religion. You cannot force anybody to become a Muslim. You have the choice to believe or not to believe. If you want to believe, then you, this is what you have to do. If you don't want to believe, it's up to you. There is not, no, actually it's against Islamic philosophy to force anybody to believe in Islam. Because we'll make them hypocrites, and hypocrite will be worse than, you know, in, in the Quran it's worse, right? To become my, my someone who portrays Islam and hide other than that. So there's a choice. Now, I, I am a Muslim here living in the West. I don't see any contradiction. Actually, I think I'm free to worship God here, according to Islam, more than 80% of the Muslim countries. I wouldn't feel the same way. I am I'm a product of this country, basically. I was able to create an organization. I was able to create multiple mosques. I was worship, raise my children according to Islam, with total freedom. I don't see any contradiction at all. To respond to the Quranic verses, that many of us, when Muslims who are confronted with the question, is there violence in Islam? We tend only to cite those verses that say there is no compulsion in, in the Quran. But then there is another verse that says, he who rejects the faith, kill him. Kill the infidels. Wait for them, ambush them, and take away their property. Now, I can imagine why you would ignore those verses. No, I wouldn't but ignore if them. there are Muslims... No, I wouldn't if, ignore them. Wait, if wait. there are Muslims... I, I would not ignore them, but I would interpret them the right way. You see, the problem How with many... How do I interpret kill the infidels? Yeah. No, wait. The problem is the following. People don't understand the Arabic language. They go to the Quran, pick and choose verses, grab them out of line, and implement them and say them outright, which is a big, I think, a big deception. Because the right way is you know the context. The verses you talked about, they are talking about the infidels of Mecca, the people who rejected the Prophet, the people who went after him. It talks about those. It doesn't talk about any, anybody else. How could it be in Islam, you're allowed to marry a Christian? Is it only to kill her at night? Is that what it is? I, th I think those who have read uh, great books of religion uh, recognize uh, that they are all internally contradictory. Right? All great works. I do not underrate at all the importance of democratic freedoms in Western countries. I recognize in the U.S., that without the democratic freedoms, without the free press, and without universities, the war in Vietnam would not have come to an end. I also recognize that those freedoms, that the press is no longer as free as it was, and the universities are under threat today. I, 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 I work in a university. I also recognize that there is a very, there's a specificity to modern Western empires, and that specificity is the democracy at home has gone hand in hand with despotism overseas. And a second specificity has been an amazing PR job of always taking the moral high ground. You can take it from British imperialism in the 19th century when the Brits went to India, they talked about sati, 
women being burnt on the funeral pyre of dead husbands. They talked about child marriage. When they went to Africa, they talked about slavery. Today, they talk of female genital mutilation. It is always a question of going to save minorities, women, minorities, and to civilize majorities. But the minorities have never been saved. They've been turned into proxies. Because if you dominate a society from the outside, that is the worst way to reform that society. First of all, I don't think that the entire Muslim world, if you'll pardon me, is dominated by outside societies. But much of the Muslim world is suffering. Uh, and it's not all colonials. Many, many societies have been colonized and are doing much better uh, than, than, than Muslim societies that have also been colonized. Saudi Arabia was never colonized. So we have to disaggregate the, you know, the kind of um, categorical statements that, uh, that uh, tend to sweep all of these things into the same boat. I think that Islam um, has a problem in a general way. And, it's, and it has to do right now with an absence of authority. Religions, all religions, evolve over time. We, Christians, have to ignore, you know, like in Leviticus, where it says to kill homosexuals. Well, even Jerry Falwell's not saying that. You know, we just collectively say, we're not going to do that. So we, we, we pass over, you know, the, 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 the sorts of things in our religion and our holy books that we cannot tolerate. And we've evolved past that. Now, I see Islam in a turbulent situation in a place where the, you know, the caliphate, whatever it was, has disappeared. There's no one who speaks for Islam. It's so divided now. I would like to the center, I would disagree. The and, center and, and, of and Islam let me tell you, right now. Let me tell you why. Okay. Because I have an exactly opposite point of view. Uh, I do, I do. The, look, the, the Catholic Church in Europe was organized on the prototype of the Roman Empire. The Protestant churches in Europe were organized prototype of the nation state. American Christianity was different because it was organized on a congregationist basis, it, a sectarian, completely detached from the state itself, blasphemy, right of blasphemy was hugely important in Europe because the church was an earthly power. Secularism was hugely important because it defined the boundary between the state as a power and the church as a power. In the US, religion can have a presence in the public sphere. Now, Islam, the beauty of it, I think, is that there is no such power as the Catholic Church. The beauty of it is that in Sunni Islam, five people can get together, all you need is a prayer leader. In Shia Islam, you have a Catholic church type, you have a Protestant church type, European authority. In Iran, which is very recent, Vila'atul Faqih. But it's not all over Shia Islam, Sistani disagrees. So if you think the problem is that Islam does not have an authority, which I know is the view of many in the US administration and elsewhere, what they want is a repressive power in Islam who will keep Muslims in line. Yeah, if you want democracy to. and you want ferment, you can't have that authority. I think authority. that Islam does have an authority and it's Al Jazeera. I mean, I think that that's what's happened is that, you know, you've lost the, that nobody really speaks for the, for the believers. It's true that there's supposed to be no mediating force between the, between the worshiper and his God. But there are. There are. There are imams and there, there's, a, you know, the, the Al-Azhar. Al there are all these people that pretend to speak for Islam. It's not, it's a fiction. There's so many things to talk about. It is cowardly of people in the West, especially in this country, the way they reacted to the cartoons, the way some people react to Rushdie. I categorically condemn that sort of behavior. I mean, I don't care how victimized you are, it is an insult to those millions of Muslims who did not become violent who did not ask for the right of these people to be taken away from them. I think that it comes from a position of weakness to constantly excuse uh, the, the, this okay. behavior. I just want to underscore more that in the, indeed uh, colonialism and racism are two excuses that are used to distract attention from where it should be, namely what is wrong 
with Islam and what's wrong within Islam. Islam and Islamic civilization ha itself has been a colonizing power. It has been an empire. It was um, devised or at least founded somewhere in Mecca and it has spread all the way to India and China and so on. And it is very, very important not to confuse Islam, which is a body of ideas, a philosophy with ethnicity. And I really take objection to Mr. Mamdani's, you know, the whole story of the black community here and um, the Islamic, uh, or what you consider um, Islamic communities and how you treat them. Uh, blacks and how they were treated here as an ethnic minority and as an ethnic group is and cannot be compared to the relationship between the West and East. These are two competing and sometimes clashing philosophies, but not ethnic uh, clashes or discrimination on that level. Very briefly, to, to what just what Hershey said, I mean, the fact that uh, the fact that racism is often used as an excuse, or colonialism, or imperialism, doesn't mean that it is not a problem. I mean, racism is real. And, and many of us have experienced it. You cannot say that it is not, it, it is, there is nothing there, it's just a pretext. Muslim societies are ancient societies, true, but now they are living under a transformed reality and they have to come to terms with that. I think you can compare probably maybe uh, Egypt today or Jordan with the U.S. 50 years after independence maybe. But it's unfair to compare the U.S. today with Jordan today 50 years or 60 years after has become independent and have come to live with a different type of state. I celebrate the lack of centralized religious authority. That is absolutely the most liberating aspect about being a Muslim, is that there is no pope, there is nobody to tell me what Islam means. It is up to me to find out and to be responsible for what I find out. I knew we'd have some disagreement. Um, <laughs> We're now uh, opening it up to you. Yes. Hi. I just wanted to know, be very interested to know um, about what all of you think about the current crisis in Darfur in Sudan and the best way that we can resolve that crisis. Thank you very much for the question because this is an exact illustration of talking of racism, racism within Islam. There is an ethnic cleansing going on in Sudan by Arabs uh, ethnically cleansing or trying to cleanse or kill or exterminate the black people unless they convert to Islam, unless they become Muslims. Actually, Darfur has been Muslim for longer than northern Sudan. My part of Sudan was Christian when Darfur was already Muslim. It is not an Islam issue and it is not true that it is done in the name of Islam either. And talking about races, it is races, yes. But why ascribe it to Islam, I, I don't understand. I mean, the fact that Muslims on both sides of the issue, are, are, people on both sides of the issue are Muslim, does not mean that the problem is Islamic. Uh, and I think it is racist, but also the, 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 I really take objection to, there was a, an announcement, sort of uh, an advertisement in the New York Times, I think yesterday or this morning, about asking the American government to intervene. Uh, I think that would be a disaster. You are not capable of solving any problem. <laughs> Seriously. Look at Iraq today. I mean, how can anybody who, who really appreciates the, the ironies of history talk about another intervention while Iraq is going on in this way? Yes, sir. So I was curious to know what you, your thoughts were about oil as a factor in this... Um, Question. I, I wish there was no oil in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. will be, it will be less problems, I think. I think the West looked at the Middle East as a reservoir of oil, and they want to protect the source of oil so they can continue the flow to, to fuel the economy of the West. Therefore, they can manipulate, install dictators. And the biggest issue is, you know, the United States is calling for democracy in the Arab world. Well, when you want democracy, start with your friends first. They have friends who are allies. They're not democratic. <coughs> They're even worse Democrat than before, but now nobody is asking them to become democratic society. Everybody's keeping a close eye on what they do, but we're asking the extreme element, the ones who are not friendly, to become democratic. You know, in the, in the oil countries, the, the problem what's happened in the Arab world is the disparity of wealth. There are people who are extremely rich and people who are extremely poor. And the poor look at the have and the have not, you have that issue there. 
Plus, the whole geopolitics of the oil is really what's driving the situation. You like any Muslim you ask in the streets in the Arab countries, why America in Iraq is because of the oil. That's the first answer you will get. It's because of the oil. So that I think the oil is a curse in the Middle East. I agree that the oil is a curse. With which dictator do we install in the Middle East right now? I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's, well, we didn't install the Saudi royal family. They installed themselves. Uh, it's, but it's true that oil is pernicious in terms of democracy and freedom. There's only one country that has a lot of oil and has escaped that, and it's Norway. And it got oil long after it had a constitutional monarchy, but even in our own country, Louisiana <laughs> was a good example of the damage that oil can do to democracy. Um, so, do you want to include your native Texas? In yes, that? I have to say that Texas has had its problems with democracy as well. Yes. My question is to Dr. Nafisi, please. Um, you were mentioning about the, uh, you were upset that uh, the, the West doesn't understand the difference between Iran and, and other Muslim world, and we're all in the same pot. But you also uh, mentioned Sharia law and the veil as a minor detail of the society. Don't you think it's because of the two that we are all in the same category from the uh, Western eyes, because we are forced to practice that? Because of... Uh the Sharia laws we are... And the veil that puts us with the chador and the hijab. Yes, we all look alike to their eyes, rightly so, because we follow that Sharia law. I agree with you that that is what Western pe people here see most. And, and that is, I guess, why we're here. Um, because we have to bring out those alternative images and, and, and we have to differentiate uh, between those who want to politically impose this uniformity upon us and, and, and the people um, who don't and, and, and the variety of the people and, 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 and a culture um, that 750 years ago a poet named Hafez uh, talked about hypocritical clerics who flog in public and drink wine in private and who had an atheist philosopher poet called Omar Khayyam. Um, we, we should remind people um, of the fact that this university is virtual reality and, and it's not you real. Know, you know, just the example, we take Iran as an example forcing hijab, but, but look what Hamas did that in, what the, in the Palestinian territory. It did not enforce hijab. Actually, they have in, their, in, in part of their members Christians. In the, in, the, in the local assembly, they voted for Christians in there. So why can't we look also, there's another Islamist who came, they did not enforce hijab, they did not ban beer, they did not, and they even condemned burning of church, they condemned the kidnapping of journalists, well, and this well, is the Prime Minister. Okay, I want to get to two more questions, I think. Yes, sir. Uh, for any panelist, uh, you've described a number of the problems. We haven't talked much about the solutions. What solutions do you see that we ought to take in the United States, or that Muslims ought to take, to get us out of the mess we're in now? I think you should pose the right questions before, before getting to solutions. You know, I think that that is the most important thing. But I, I think one thing that uh, citizens of this country can do is to hold their own country to its own values. Because... I think people like myself and, and, and Mahmoud and others who are trying to promote values of self-determination and democracy and respect for universality of human rights are undermined conceptually and politically by the hypocrisy of the foreign policy of this country. <laughs> and I think that the point is, my appeal is, by the way, I, I condemn the invasion of Iraq as colonialism in the classical sense because it is taking over sovereignty by military conquest without legal justification. But it is the first colonial f uh, war that was protested by the citizens of the colonial power even before the war started. That is, if you remember that February day when 80, 85 cities around the world, people came out in protest, millions of Americans came out in protest against the war. Now, that is a good beginning for the solutions that we should seek for. Yes, right here. So I'd like to put to the panel um, the question, what's the matter with the West? Because it does seem to be that there's a self-loathing that's evident in the West. 
that it is increasingly raising its head. We're taught at our universities that the dead white men raped and pillaged. There's nothing particularly enlightening about the Enlightenment. And actually, we've got a lot to be embarrassed about. And it seems that there's a complete disbelief in any vision or conviction anymore. So my question is, perhaps, is the problem more a lack of faith and belief in a vision of the West? Well, if there's one thing about the West that... Well, the West, the West. I mean, I'm getting really sick and tired of saying it. Um, that, that I admire uh, is its ability to self-criticize. I mean, that, that is at the heart of um, what my profession is, which is literature, that you need to be subversive of yourself. And, and of course, uh, if you're not subversive of yourself, if you're not restless with yourself, if you're not questioning of yourself, um, then you die. Uh, when 9-11 happened, I told my friends that there are certain acts that are absolutely evil, and, and this was one of them. But that doesn't make us all good. And there is always this... Um, uh, this propensity when something that evil happens for us to become sanctimonious and self-righteous and I think that is what threatens the West and the East. I want to say one sentence. I'm really worried about legitimizing or justifying any form of censorship on ideas uh, under the rubric of uh, people being insulted. Because first of all, if we are equal and Muslims should want to be equal, then you can't be insulted. You know, you're part of the game. Uh, the, the Iranians had a, a whole cartoon exhibition of the Holocaust, and, and, and they were ignored, partly because they don't count. And, and there are some people in here that they think that Mr. Bush should know better, but Mr. Ahmadinejad, that is all we expect from him. Now, as an Iranian and as a person born into a Muslim family, I resent that, and I think that this is what we need to have. We need to have equality both in terms of everything that my colleagues here have said and equality in criticism and, and, and self-criticism. And, and that goes both for Islam and the West. Those are fine words to end on. I want to thank our panelists for a great discussion. I want to thank all of you for coming.